<coughs> and before we get started today proper, what we would like to do is just discuss a few uh, little housekeeping things with you if we can. Uh, because they actually will deal with some emotions that you have uh, as well. So we'd like to talk about a couple of those things. And then what we would, do, what we would like to do too, just uh, for the first little section perhaps, is offer you the opportunity again to ask Mary some more questions. If you feel... <laughs> or myself, if you want. That was, I, I didn't think that was going to happen. <laughs> So I felt that. So. And then uh, we'll get started on the uh, discussion with our spirit friends about answering a lot of their questions. And so those of you who are mediums or have felt certain impressions of certain questions from spirits, I'd love you to participate in that process as well. We do have some questions that, that uh, have been emailed to us, uh, but if you have some questions here and now, um, it, that would also be good to ask those questions. The reason why we wanted to do that is because it, it just helps those spirits understand what's really going on. A lot of spirits have a lot of difficulty understanding uh, what's going on in terms of even in the spirit world and also why they are where they are and so we wanted to address a lot of those issues. So we start with some housekeeping. Uh, my request is that if something happens in the um, venue or in the grounds um, if you could come and let us know. Uh, we've had quite a few incidences now of things being spilled, things being broken. Last night there was a um, leak in one of the processing rooms um, that someone had obviously noticed but just didn't let us know. If you can, it's not about confessing or anything, but if you let us know, then we can take action on it immediately rather than um, having to call people out at night when everyone's gone home, when we discover it. Yeah. So it's just really a courtesy. Um, this is such a beautiful venue and um, the second thing that I wanted to address was around children. Can I, before you address the children issue, I'd just like to talk about your emotions about why you don't come and say something that's about what's been broken and, and what's going on. Many of us have these emotions from our childhood that when we, got in, when we did something wrong by accident, we finished up getting punished for it, right? And so a lot of the times what's happening here is that somebody will do something by accident but, but then, it get, then they're afraid of getting punished or somehow getting singled out or somehow... And, and what is happening is that there's a law of attraction event to help you deal with that emotion. So let's deal with these emotions even in the venue. Does that make sense to everyone? Rather than just running off and not, and not having that opportunity to deal with that emotionally. Because what happened last night was that, that from that leak, like we had to finish up calling Anna and calling Peter and then they called someone else and you know, all that could have happened during the day rather than when people were doing all the other things that they were doing uh, if we had been let know much sooner. Does that make sense to everyone? So it's an actually an act of love to say something, even if you didn't create it, to say something, oh, this, or point something out in terms of, like last, last fortnight ago, there was a toilet broken in the woman's toilets. Um, now, the seat, I think, broke. The lid of the seat. The lid of the seat. And nobody let us know. And it was only later when we went in there that we noticed it was broken. Um, so obviously something happened, uh, but nobody wants to sort of own up to those things. And so we need to also look at what, what's going on emotionally that causes us to not own up to things that we do. There's something going on there emotionally. And also, why do we then not take responsibility for it? Like if I broke your toilet in your home, like I would offer to fix it and pay for that. Well, why, don't, why doesn't that happen? Well, because there's some kind of emotion going on within the person that causes them to not do that. So what we need to do is address these things emotionally. You, we're here learning about love <laughs> and then not practicing love. That seems to be a bit pointless, don't you think? So it'd be best if we can learn to practice love while we're in the venue that we're in. Anyway, that's what I would say about it. Yeah. Go on, second thing now. Um, the second thing was a, around children. There's lots of kids who come and AJ and I really love it that children come um, to these sessions. They're welcome to be here or, or be in the grounds or whatever. 
But there, there's been quite a few incidences where people have um, noticed that kids are in the garden, uh, kids are running around, kids are in the processing rooms. And it's great if kids want to be in the processing rooms processing an emotion, but if they're playing, obviously that's impacting on everyone else's ability to use those rooms. And what I wanted to talk about with everyone was, um, well, with the parents, is about their emotions that their children are reflecting around um, lack of respect for property, um, lack of love of ourselves that then our children um, are reflecting into the environment around us. Um, yeah. And some also have the emotion that if somebody's got a lot of money, then it's okay for us to abuse that fact. Does that make sense? Because quite often we have a tendency to say, oh, they've got the money, they can fix that, or they've got the money, they can do that. And that's not showing gratitude or appreciation. So, so let's look deeper at the underlying emotions, again, of what's going on. Now, remember, what, parent, what children do is a reflection of what parents... has to do with the parents' emotions. So I don't feel like talking to the children. <laughs> I feel like talking to the parents that have, have the children and, work, and helping the parents work through their own emotions about the issue. Am I? I'll turn it down a little. You can speak some more about it if you like, darling. Yep, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Nina wants to ask something. Can we just have a microphone? Yeah, thanks. Um, I, I just feel challenged actually saying this, but um, I know the day that Sol was here, my son, there was uh, a frangipani branch, I think, that was snapped off. Yeah. And um, we went out and spoke to the kids. But on the way home, Sol and I were sharing that this is a really beautiful venue and in no way any disrespect um, intended in this comment, but Sol felt that it wasn't very child friendly. You know, he wasn't even allowed to sit on the grass. Yep. Um, and he felt pressured by that. Or I don't know if pressure is the right word, but he was respectful of that, but he also felt a certain sense of discomfort about, I don't know how quite to put it, but I, under, I felt it and maybe that's why he's feeling the but I want to own it and bring it up. Well, because to me it's real. I'm happy to respect that Peter and Anna don't want us to sit on the grass, but in another thing, yeah, okay, I'm, I'm happy to be challenged on yeah, it emotionally as well. I don't want to actually have Peter and Anna address any of these issues, if that's all right. The reason why I don't want to have them address any of these issues is because there's a big issues of trying to rebel against authority here that most people have inside of themselves. You see, when you're offered a gift, and if the gift, if the gift is offered on some provisos, right, then the acceptance of the gift is dependent upon those provisos, I suppose you could say. And we, we all need to come to appreciate at some point too, in a way, that there are certain acts of love that are involved here. Now, if somebody, if somebody says to you, it's their property, and they have created it, and they're saying to you, please respect how I treat my own property, then my being on that property means that I need to respect how they would treat their own property. Which Sol was happy to do. No, he's not, no, because you're not. You're not. <laughs> Does that make sense? He's not because you're not. You see, if I, when I was a child, I can remember oftentimes going along to somebody's pristine property, and my, my mother and father had certain issues with different with different things emotionally, and I can remember feeling quite strongly that I had to respect what the owners of it, not my own parents, but what the owners of its feelings were about the particular venue. So while I may not, I'm not saying whether I agree or not agree with the rule to not sit on the grass or not, what I'm saying is that the fact is, you're, I'm a, if I own a property, right, I'm allowed to make a rule if I want to whether that rule is harmonious or disharmonious with love is immaterial. Do you follow me? If, I have a, if somebody else has an emotional response to that rule, then there is an emotion through the law of attraction being brought up for you for that. So, so what I'm suggesting here is to focus on your own emotions. If it, if it feels like something's going on inside of yourself then, or inside of your child if you have children here, then look at your own emotions about that. This is an opportunity to deal with that emotion. 
Do, do you follow me? And um, rather than going down the track of saying, oh, but it's this and oh, but that, just look at your own emotions because you know what I feel? When we deal with those emotions, you may find that actually the rules governing the property change. Does that make sense? Well, for Through me, I think um, Sol felt a certain amount of tension around. I think maybe that's why things are happening also. No, no, no. See, see Nina. Nina, stop saying Sol. Sol feels. Sol is your son. It's actually your I deny my feelings. Right? This is something for all parents to remember. And so then soul feels it. Right? So if I focus as a parent, whoa, if I focus as a parent <laughs> that I'm denying my feelings about this issue, you are feeling controlled in the venue. Right? And all souls feeling all, and, and soul, he's a sensitive voice, so he do, he doesn't act upon a rebellious feeling because you don't have a feeling of rebellion in you but if you did he would actually be rebelling about this whole issue because you're denying your own feelings about being controlled so for many of the parents what's happening emotionally is they are feeling controlled in this venue right and then that's getting reflected onto the children right and so the children go out of control does that make sense that because they're just acting sense. out their rebellious feelings of the parent that they've not healed do you, do you follow me? Yeah. Now, when we deal with all of that, you will probably find the law of attraction will bring you an entirely different situation so you no longer feel controlled. Do you, do you follow me with that as well? Yeah. So this, this, is, this is why I don't want to discuss the issue with... Um, I'm going to have to change my batteries. Um, with, with Anna and Peter, because in the end, it's not their issue. It's actually our issue with regard to love and unhealed emotions that we need to resolve. Yeah? And, and it's not a true statement to say, I feel grateful, but I think, you know, we're not displaying gratitude if we feel it sh it's not done right. It's not done how I would do it. It's not, you know, that it belies the fact that we'd, we'd actually don't have a true sense of gratitude around it. So just to keep that in mind, yeah. Good on you for being brave about it, Nina. <laughs> It's really great, Nina, that you, you brought that up because it's a major thing to understand as a parent that our children's emotions we often justify as their emotions but really they came from us in the first place, like they are within us. And the key is to be brave enough firstly to admit that that's the case and then secondly to address that emotionally. When we address it emotionally, what will happen is the law of attraction on the issue will certainly change, right? And so in the end, we'll end up with a venue where it's very child-friendly, wherever that venue be. Does that make sense? Just through the law of attraction. But at, but at this point, how can that be created when we've all got these unhealed emotions about being controlled and not getting our own way and feeling upset when we don't get our own way? And you know, fit? Like, I've had people come out to stay with us, and I've given one rule, like, don't use a candle in my eco tent yeah, that I gave to Monica that well, I've already mentioned and she's angry with me for a day about it do you know what I mean like so where's the gratitude there which we pointed out and worked our way through but and this is this is the issue that we need to to, to follow up I would probably have never said that if that emotion had never been within her does that make sense? So you did that deliberately to trigger her or that was just something you spontaneously said? No, there's no candles in our eco tents. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. But, but if Monica didn't have a, a huge emotion around feeling that she deserves to get what she wants and that's how she feels loved, um, I'm loved if a person gives me what I want then she wouldn't have had any reaction to that rule. Yeah, I, I don't go to your house and then you tell me, oh, you know, this is the way we use our shower and I go, oh, I'm upset now, <laughs> like, with you. I'm, you know, I'm going to do it different, you know, like, and, and, then, and then get really upset with you when you tell me that I'm wrong and then, and, like, you'd be well within your rights to kick me out of your home under those circumstances. And the way I feel is that Peter would be well within his rights to kick us out of the venue just on one of these issues if he decided he wanted to take it, you know, right down to how much love is being demonstrated 
Does that I, make sense? Like, I'm overwhelmed by this gift every time we enter this venue. Like, and it's comfortable, you can hear us. There's amazing DVD production happening now because of it. There's a beautiful kitchen, we can play music, we can have a party. Like, there's air conditioning, even though some of Somebody you don't like that. <laughs> <laughs> and, and also, I, I feel... A lot of you then feel that I might be pandering to Peter and Anna, but as Anna and Peter know, the people who offer their venue often get the most, <laughs> most feedback in terms of their emotions and their feelings. So, so Anna and Peter are not a absent from truth from us. Do you understand? So as they both well know. Right? And you may feel that it's, that it's different, but that's not the case. What we're trying to do here is address the issue of we're here to learn about practising love. So let's learn about practising love and put it into action while we're here, if that makes sense to you. Uh, AJ, with the question of kids and reaction to parents' emotions, yep. there's a situation that the kids are here with all the rest of us who have got our emotions too. And, and reflecting those emotions. And they're reflecting theirs as well too, so that if we're, say if we're minding children, they'll be reflecting our emotions at that time, or the kids are reflecting the the combined emotion of or, everyone here. Or reflecting their parents' emotions towards that minder. Yeah. One of the two, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So if we understand that the children's response is... It, it, so I'm not asking you to go home and give your children a paddy whack because of what happens, right? This is the opposite, the opposite. of what, what we're saying. What we're saying is let's address... Let's look at... Be self-reflective and let's look at, as an adult, these are the feelings that I'm feeling and let's be honest about the feelings... Uh, how do you feel towards rich people? <coughs> Many of us have these big emotions about someone who's rich, don't we? Like, you know, feel a bit angry with them, feel that, why did they get it? And I didn't feel, you know, all these different kinds of emotions that we need to access. And our children, if they're here with us, will reflect those emotions. Does that make sense? So this is what we need to do. We need to address these things. Just because we are poor, it doesn't now make us absent from love and in fact one of the reasons why we're poor is because there are some absences from love in our life that we need to address right so you know where we might have a lack of abundance or we might have different viewpoints about money or we might have different viewpoints about gifts and gratitude and all these different things need to be allowed to be triggered within us and allow ourselves to access the underlying causal emotion of why we can't act harmonious with love. So if our child is not acting harmonious with love, don't blame the child. The child is just reflecting your own unhealed emotions about why you're not acting harmonious with, with love. Does that make sense? Let yourself, allow yourself to see that. And you know when we did the parenting discussion, which was back in Brisbane, uh, what would be six months ago now I suppose, um, many of the people who came, that, remember how small the group was? It was the smallest group we've ever done, right, in the last 12 months probably. And why was that? Because the majority of parents don't want to know <laughs> about the real causes of why their children do things, right? And as parents, we need to look at that. Like, why don't we want to know? Because we feel responsible, we feel sad. We're really, we have a lot of capping anger and then a lot of fear. And in the side, there is this deep inner feeling or knowing Oh, maybe I am responsible, <laughs> you know, and we want to avoid that, you know, we want to get away from that all the time. So allow yourselves to just see our children's actions as a reflection of our own condition, right? And if we're in a group, then the children's reactions are a reflection of the group's condition. In fact, if you think about it, the children are an ideal indicator to what I have unhealed in me. And I was talking to someone yesterday about autistic children and, and Asperger's. Is he here today who was talking to yesterday? No. Um, but, but if you've got an autistic child, that's even better. <laughs> because they are a perfect reflector of their entire environment. Far better than even an average child is. They have no sense of self because of the barrage of emotions that's coming from, its in, from their environment. And they reflect perfectly what's going on. So if, if, a, if an autistic child comes up and just gives you a belt and you know straight away that something's going on either with you, an emotion in you that they don't like or something that a parent has, their parent has towards you, that, you know, and you can address all of those issues straight away emotionally. These are all opportunities 
So to get into our emotions. Does that make sense? Yeah? If we go... AJ, just talking about the control, <coughs> excuse me, the control um, issue that probably most of us parents have. Yep. Underneath that, is it a grief of not having free will or what's underneath the control issue? Uh, every issue generally breaks into two, two sections. So let's look at the two sections. And this is something to remember with all of your emotional processing work. You see, most of the time we only look at one leg of these two sections. So here's an issue. Let's say the issue is control. Right? One, of those, one of the ways that we will go is we'll externalise control. So we either externalise it, and so we resist anyone ever controlling us. Does that make sense? So on this, on this side, we finish up becoming... We, we get really upset and angry whenever anybody tries to control us. Does that make sense? So anger about being controlled. Or perceived control. Or perceived control. Because a lot of... Lot, like, a person giving a request about what happens in their own environment is not, not control. But we perceive it as control, we get angry, and that comes from a very much an unhealed emotion back in our childhood about control. The alternative is that we internalise the control. So, so we get into a state where we feel we're allowed to control others. Does that make sense? And whenever we can't control someone else, we get angry. So it's angry about not being able to control someone else. Does that make sense? Yeah, like when you ask your children to do something and they don't. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, that's a parent's issue about ex uh, that, that they've now gone angry about not being able to control somebody else because of the internal issues they have regarding control. So we either externalise or internalise things generally with a lot of different examples. And I can give you lots of different examples on different emotions. For, for instance, and it, uh, that when a child is abused sexually, it either internalises the abuse or externalises the abuse. So what happens when it grows up? It either becomes an abuser or it, it doesn't heal the abuse inside of itself and it becomes like self-abusive. Or attracts further abuse. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. So for us to heal the control issue yep. and work through our emotions, wh what's the next step after, you know, feeling what it feels like to be controlled? Or well, so, I... yeah, so we feel frustration or anger at being controlled. Yeah. Remember, anything from mild irritation is anger anyway. So that's where we're not getting something we want to get. We're not getting something we expect to get. Any time you have any of those emotions, it's because of an unhealed emotion within yourself. Can we talk about addictions? Because this is yeah. really relevant here. Yeah. Um, often we can develop an addiction from our childhood where we always got what, our, what we wanted. We always had our free will enabled. And then we grow to have a very unloving projection out the world that, I should get whatever I want. So in that case, you're not going to be grieving, I was controlled. You're going to have to grieve in the here and now, the reality, which is more in line with God's truth, that I do not have the right to control. And a lot of people, um, I just had two discussions with people this morning around that very issue. Often we're like, oh, I need to go back and feel the pain. And very often that's what's happened. Um, but some of us also have developed very unloving addictions in our, as we grew um, because we were taught something in our home life that was very out of harmony with God's love, God's truth of the universe. And that's when we have to grieve in the here and now that I had a huge one around, I should be loved. Yep, people should love me. If they're not loving me, it's not right. And I can get angry about that. When, in fact, people don't have to love me. It's a gift to receive love from others. Uh, and so I had to grieve in the here and now. Actually, not everyone loves me. Um, and now I see love as a gift. And, and it's a gift for me to give as well. I don't feel as obliged to give it, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I see how that's very relevant. Yeah. So can you see how sometimes we've developed so many unloving behaviours that when those unloving behaviours are challenged by a rule, for example, we immediately go into rebellion. Now, whenever we're in rebellion, there is an underlying emotional reason. 
And we need to look at it very seriously at all the times we feel rebellious. Because in the end, remember that, that the law of attraction brings you perfect events to trigger the emotions to bring you closer to God. So, so if my rebellion is getting triggered, then what are we going to do with rebellion with God? God's made like lots and lots of laws, <laughs> right, to govern her universe. Like there's a law of gravity. You want to rebel against that? Well, you can use it, can't you, to your advantage. You can actually use another law that's higher than that and overcome gravity. But you want to rebel against gravity by jumping off a building without knowing the other laws, then you're a goner, right, <laughs> basically. So, so this is the thing. We need to come to learn that God actually has a whole lot of laws governing the universe, the highest of which are the laws of divine love. And once we come to understand that and really get to feel that emotionally and see the love in each of one of these laws that God's created, then we'll start not also not projecting a feeling of rebellion onto our environment. Because the biggest problem we have on the planet today, one of the biggest problems, is that, is that we are constantly rebelling against God's laws. And this is why our environment is progressively getting worse and worse and worse from a pollution perspective and from a destruction of the environment perspective because we all want our own comforts and fears and everything allayed and we're willing to rebel against law in order to do that. And so it's a really big issue and it's great that this is an opportunity <laughs> to actually address the issues like this that are within us where we want to be unloving and we need to look really closely at our own emotions about that. Yeah? Thank you. No worries. Um, AJ, on the flip side, um, you know, I feel so grateful to you and Mary and Anna and Peter. Um, how, how should we show that to you? Should, like if we all give you a cuddle every <laughs> session or... I mean, I know that could be overwhelming for you all. So what, what should we be doing? <laughs> what would you like? Well, a lot of people come up to give me a cuddle and yet, and yet for the previous week they've been projecting anger at me. Sorry? So you know what I would like? I'd prefer that they didn't give me a cuddle and they stopped projecting anger at me. <laughs> That's what I would like. In other words, what I would like is for you to just act lovingly, like let the love that's in you start shining all the time. I don't need cuddles from you to show, you, to show me that you love me or appreciate me. Does that make sense? What I would, and, and often when we do need cuddles, we are very needy and we actually need to deal with some very unloving projections we're making at other people. So it's not just coming up to you or Anna and Peter saying, thank you, thank you. It's not, it's just acting well, lovingly. in your day-to-day -day treatment of the environment, treat it in a thankful way. Okay. And if you truly have gratitude, that's what will happen anyway. Yeah. You, you'll just be expressing it through your actions all of the time. Yeah. And, and in fact, those actions will then be noticeable and the, and the people who pr provide you with any gift, well, whoever that person is, will know that you're automatically grateful by the feeling you have within yourself of gratitude that motivates your action. Oh, thank you. Yeah. So you don't have to go up and say, oh, thank you all the time, thank you all the time. By your action, demonstrate how you feel about it, just, just by your positive action. Yeah. yeah. Is there any other questions about that subject? Or have we just shocked everyone into silence? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, that's all we wanted to really say about those things. I think there wasn't anything else, was there, that we needed to... Oh, yeah. Just reiterate. Um, just reiterate, the processing rooms are for emotional processing. So if the children are emotional processing, we're very happy for them to be in the room. But not to use the rooms as a, like, games room that actually when somebody goes down there crying, they open the door and the children are in there playing, so now they've got to go and find somewhere else. And all that does is just stop the processing from going on. So, so again, with as parents, we need to look at that issue of, like, again, the issue of why we would actually have this emotion of wanting to prevent others from processing their emotions. Does that make sense? So if we explain to our children what's going on, these are special rooms for processing emotion and encourage them to go to them if they have some emotions of upset to deal with, that's fine. But if we, if we don't have that attitude towards openness, towards processing our own emotion, there's a high likelihood our children will actually be playing down in those rooms. Do you follow me? Everything is related through the law of attraction. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, all right, what we'd like to do now is just uh, open up any questions about... I thought just about yesterday. About in yesterday, general. in general. So for you or for me? Yeah, yeah. For, for us both. Uh, 
we're on up. Yeah, sorry. That's it. Hi. Um, I'm, um, I had an experience yesterday. Um, I just wanted to kind of fess up that I'd been cross with you. And, yeah. um, but my heart opened yesterday. And I've been fighting, you know, this path that yeah. I'm willing now. I've yeah. decided to... I have been doing some emotional processing, so I have, you know, I've... Um, I, basically, the problem that I have is that... Um, is that I have... Um, I, I've been on a spiritual path pretty much all my life, searching since I was 17, and I've been committed to, like, um, three spiritual paths, and I'm not really such a butterfly that I'd go easily into another one. It's a little bit like falling in love, you know? You kind of... <laughs> <laughs> you fall in love and everything's wonderful and then you find out something isn't quite it anymore and you yeah. fall out of love. And um, and so I think I've got some stuff... <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> Obviously. Yeah, it's coming up. That's so I, this is what I want to share with you yesterday. You know, I want to kind of apologise for what, where I've been crossed. And I've been crossing my good friend Angela here who's been on two of my journeys together for yeah. like half a lifetime, you yeah. know? So... Um, do, do you but, mind saying why you've been cross? Can you? Is it okay? You, you feel like? Um, well, I've been cross. Yesterday was exactly what I needed. Thank you, because um, it, I, I'm really, I'm really okay if you are Jesus. It's just that um, I don't know. I didn't. I don't know why I didn't even like it. You know, it's like I think it's because I, I, I thought about it this morning. And I think it's because one of my paths that I was in for 16 years, we studied the world's religions and we had um, channeling, if you like, from, from Jesus and from uh, Mary Magdalene, who is called Magda. So I'm a little bit pissed off that that may not be true. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I don't know. I haven't, like, I believe that. And I used to say, well, why would Jesus even come here? It makes no sense. Right, 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 right. Yeah. makes more sense for him to be in heaven and helping us from up there, you know? Yeah, yeah. So, um, and, and it won't, look, I've been promoting your work anyway and saying, look, he says it's Jesus, but look, don't worry about it because what he says yeah, is really, really that, good. You know? Fast forward. <laughs> Go for the emotional minutes. clearing because that's where the, that's real and that works. And I've been, so, so I've been like, no, I'll only, and I'm getting really feisty now that I, because I've, I guess I was, I was I was like a young soul who just believed everything yeah. and now I've come to the bloody fourth show and I'm not about <laughs> to believe everything, you know, and I'm not a kid anymore. So, um, but anyway, and, and I've spent the last eight years actually um, trying to unravel my beliefs and now you're talking about belief and faith yesterday. So I'm like, um, all I know for myself is to, when I open my heart, you know, which I did to yesterday and I'm like, <laughs> no, just want to go. And I That's a bummer, that, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> That's what I know is true. And my mind it gets in the way. But I've heard a lot of teachings about a lot of other things, such as, you know, I strongly believe that from the Gnostic teachings that, that, that Mary Magdalene was never a prostitute, that she was, that she was actually, um, a, a smear campaign was done on her because she was so beloved of Jesus and she got the teaching more than the other disciples and the men were jealous. I actually think that that's probably more likely. <laughs> well, that's true, but that doesn't discount the past that I had. Um, and why wouldn't Jesus love me even if I had that past? Mm. Mm. See, a lot, a lot of times um, people, spirits in the spirit world um, have looked at where Mary is. So Mary's been, in the, when we were in the spirit world, Mary's obviously been very close to me and she's been in pretty much the same location that I am at, at, in the majority of our spirit life, right? And so the other women have looked at that and then they've looked at Mary's history and said, but, but she was this and but she was that. And then they go down this track of trying to say, oh, that's because there's this thing called sacred sexuality. You know, or they go try to describe some other reason of why Mary got into that condition. Not understanding the truth. And the truth is just that Mary had a desire for truth. And we're soulmates anyway. We're part of the same soul. And so at the end of the day, we were going to be together anyway, no matter whether I was the... You know, it, whether I was a pimp or Mary was a prostitute or any other variation, right? <laughs> and and the, the truth is that, that uh, in the end, God designed things in that manner. Now, as they happened in the first century, there was a lot of projections against the woman, obviously. And there are still a lot of injuries on this planet about women, both in the women and the men. Like, so many of you ladies have these deep injuries of anger towards men and resistance towards men and so forth as a result of those injuries. And so there's this projection at Mary that she was, that, that her life couldn't have been like that. 
Now, you have an opportunity to ask the person what her life was like. <laughs> That's one of the reasons why we come, right? To actually ask the person what her life was like. But a lot of people finish up saying to Mary, oh, you need to read this book. And Mary picks up the book and it says, oh, Life of Mary Magdalene. Why do I need to read this book? This is my life. <laughs> like, like on the, honestly, the condescension in that act is quite intense. Because basically what you're saying to Mary is that you believe that her life was like this book. And, uh, you know, as Mary herself well knows, and I well know, there's no book written on the earth that had a l that where Mary's life has been accurately portrayed. But you've got an opportunity to ask her um, by being here. But in terms of your emotions, can I just address those? Yeah. Um, it's really good that you stated your feelings, like which is this big emotional issue with regard to the mediumship and, and, and the feeling that if, if Jesus and Mary weren't channeling this information, then it was all false information and I invested 16 years of my life in that information and so forth. The truth is that we are able to channel to any person on the planet or in the spirit world in our current form, right? So being on earth doesn't limit who gets channeled to. However, much of the channelings portrayed as cha channelings that came from us come through a variety of filters, right? They come through the filter of, um, oftentimes they come through the filter firstly of the, of the stepping down through the celestial world. Obviously, you know, in the celestial kingdom, the celestial kingdom starts at sphere 8 or dimension 8 and goes to dimension 22. Now obviously the spirits in dimension 8 know a lot less from an emotional perspective than the spirits in dimension 22. Wouldn't that make sense? Right? And then of course, so there's, there's all this transition of information that goes from the higher realms of the celestial world down through the celestial world. And then this is the state of at one moment with God. And then underneath that state, you've got seven, six, five, four, right the way down, three. And then you've got where the earth is, which is generally sphere one in terms of condition. And the mediums on earth are generally in that condition. And through this process, there's often other spirits that are used to relay the information down. Some of those spirits are natural love spirits and some of them are divine love spirits, depending on the attraction or the law of attraction of the medium. So what happens is the information that began way up there is filtered down, filtered down, filtered down, and then, and then filtered through the law of attraction of the spirits that are associated with the medium. And if those spirits are natural love spirits, it gets filtered through a heap of natural love teachings and then what we are meant to have said, which we may have originally said something, has got changed through Chinese whispers through to what the medium is saying. So don't write off everything that these mediums are saying, but understand that there's this chain of, of transmission of information that occurs constantly and that ends up in gross distortion of information coming from the spirit world, particularly in, from the higher spheres of the spirit world. So while that person may have been channeling our soul, the information that they are giving may be highly distorted because of their own law of attraction. Does that make sense to everyone? So, so understand too that every one of these spiritual journeys that you've been embarked on, the four, and, and it's interesting you've had four whereas others have had 20 or whatever and like you say it's like falling in love with it and that's a really good analogy I feel because it's like for many of us there is this big emotional response when we feel new truth come to us and that's a beautiful process. Don't now latch on to this one and then say that's the end either right? because what I'm saying to you is it's not the end, there's a lot more to be said and there's a lot more we're ever going to say than what we've already presented in the future. And obviously as we remember more and more and more of what, we, you know, what we've experienced, there'll be more and more and more of that given to you as well. So, so don't, don't feel even what you've received up to now might not need to be modified. Right? The key is just to allow it to settle in your soul like you've been doing from yesterday. Allow yourself to feel the emotion of it all. Yeah. Could I just address the issue around my life? Uh, I certainly uh, didn't say yesterday that I was a prostitute. Um, I said that, that I had a lot of difficulties, a lot of hardship around sexuality in my early life and I used sexuality throughout my life in order to gain security. Um, and so, yeah, I feel there was a smear campaign about me because of the way people view people with sexual injuries. 
why should I be judged as worse because I had injuries? That's like me judging any of you for having the injuries that you have in a certain area. I'm, I'm not expressing everything that I want to say. But, um. I think you're also trying to say, isn't it, that when people say, when me, people judge Mary as either being a prostitute or not being one, wanting her to not be one, they're actually judging all prostitutes mm -hmm. and they're judging all of the emotions that every prostitute has. Mm -hmm. They're actually putting a prostitute's emotions as, as if that's worse than their own emotion. Mm -hmm. That's a judgment. Does that make sense? So yeah. quite often yeah. our positive viewpoint of wanting to have a positive viewpoint of Mary's life mm. is actually driven by a deep prejudicial mm. underlying judgmental emotion. Mm. Right? Yeah, good, good point. It was probably the case with the teacher that was teaching that. And, and also if, if, if women are honest, every woman on the planet can uh, relate in some way to prostitution. Of course. Mm -hmm. And if men are honest, every man in some way can relate to it as well. <laughs> Like the, truth, the truth is that um, you know, men prostitute themselves in different ways uh, oftentimes and often by visiting a prostitute they've prostituted themselves as well. So you know, the truth is that these emotions just exist rather than being judgmental of the emotion and rather than saying, oh, Mary wouldn't have ever been that, like what if she was? Does it matter? <laughs> so, so let's be more open than that and less judgmental of... of everyone's life as to what they've done or said or thought or and they're acted because we're in the end we're all in just this progression towards God yeah. and, and can I address some there's a lot of new age stuff that I like there's a lot out there about me which is really intimidating and I hate it and I get really triggered um, just because of I feel so unworthy of like having a lot of attention around that oh. But uh, the stuff that I have read, um, which portrays me as some kind of uh, high priestess of sex who needs to have sex with men so they can complete themselves and connect to themselves, there's a common book that a few of you have pointed out to me that portrays me in that way. Guys, that's really out of harmony with love. With love. Like any of you who've been to the sex and sexuality talk know that sex is something between you and your soulmate. That's how God designed it. So the idea of a woman needing to teach men about sex by having sex with them, um, it, that's, that's not in harmony with, with love. And that's, that's so... While I feel in the first century I did a lot of things that were out of harmony with love around sex, that's certainly not how once I was closer to God or at one with God, how I viewed sex. So just check it out for yourselves because a few of you have given me that book. Yeah. What do you think about the Da Vinci Code then, Mary? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, it painted you in a very different light in that one. Mm. I, d I really um, am, have been trying to have my own experience of it. You know, like I haven't... On purpose, it's only been in the last couple of months that I've read anything that's out there in popular literature. I read The Da Vinci Code before I met AJ and um, I thought, oh yeah, that sounds okay, but I didn't have any strong reaction to it. Um, yeah, I thought it sounded truthful. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Understand that a lot of material on the planet is channeled. Mm. So as a person's writing, often they're automatic writing really, right? And a lot of the material is channeled, coming from all sorts of areas of the spirit world. And some of the stuff I've read, I can f feel that they're writing the account of some of the things that happened in the first century. But because of the medium's ideas about men and sex, there's a lot of distortion. Like I read it, I start crying and then I go, hang on, that's not... Um, there's anger there with men and so that's colouring everything that's written. Mm. Yeah. It's interesting reading a book about yourself. <laughs> <laughs> yes, most of us haven't had the pleasure of that. <laughs> yeah. can, I, can I ask a question? And sorry, I've got the microphone. I won't hog it, but I just want to ask a question because yesterday was a very special day for us. Can I just address your emotion though? You oh. grabbed the microphone from me at the beginning so that you could ask these questions. Oh. That's what you said. <laughs> See how much you want to cover that desire up. But go ahead with the question, Barbara. Thank you, AJ. <laughs> um, 
I was very um, touched yesterday about the whole day, but one thing in particular really um, struck with me um, was that when you, AJ, mentioned about... Um, and I'll get emotional about it again. And I thought I did some process work <laughs> on it last night. <laughs> Obviously not enough yet. <laughs> when you said that a group of us will get to sphere eight and above mm -hmm. in this lifetime, yeah. that's very emotional for me. Yeah. Why would that be? Um, the main reason why these kind of things are quite emotional for you is you've got, it, when you have some celestial guides who are with you, Oftentimes you're, you're not realising the amount of love and other emotions that they're actually projecting at you of confirmation of the things that I'm saying to you. So a lot of times you're not actually having your own realisations about what I'm saying quite yet. You're actually having the projections of these celestial friends that you have around you telling you that yes, this is actually true. And because it activates this certain emotion of, in, in your case at the moment, this deep unworthiness for that to occur, what happens is that we go into tears almost immediately as a result of the contemplation of that thought. So, so if you think about it, here you are on the earth, right? You've got some celestial friends up here who, who know that this is a possibility for you. And so when I state the possibility, you have an emotion, is this a possibility for me? I don't think it's a possibility. And then they're projecting at you. Yes, this is a possibility for you. This is a possibility for you. And all of a sudden you're in tears and you're crying and feeling that, yes, this is also a possibility for me. Does that make sense? And what they're doing is they're just enabling you to recognise truth through that interaction. Now, understand that spirits in a negative condition could do the same thing with negative emotions. So this is where you have to be careful about what is actually true or not. Because in the end, you will have to have the emotion of whether it's possible or not. Right. Well, I felt it was definitely true and it was possible, but it was unworthiness. But not, but not for you. Yeah. yeah. And, that, and once you get through that emotion, you will feel that that was possible for you. Does that make sense? Once you feel that yourself. And this is what I was saying yesterday too. A lot of times, a lot of times when, people, when we talk about our identities, people have this initial flush or rush of emotion, which is actually not their own. It's actually a spirit projecting it of confirmation. But it doesn't mean the person has gone through all the emotions surrounding the issue. Right? And what we need to do is come to terms with the fact that oftentimes we don't go through the emotions surrounding the issue until events come up. So, like for example, when your family attacks you because of what I'm saying, you're going you're to be severely tested about what I'm saying. Does that make sense? Because you have deep, everyone has deep emotional hooks into their family in some way, right? So, so if I say something that confronts your family, they then confront you about seeing me, now we'll see whether you really agree with it, right? In terms of whether it's really an emotion within yourself that you actually believe to be true or it's just something you've been listening to. You'll see the difference then. And the different emotions will come up within you. So this is what will happen on all of these issues, including the issue of whether you're going to become at one with God while you're on the earth or not. The truth is that many of you will become at one with God while you're on the earth. Well, last night I decided to put the desire out for that to happen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And the truth is that if you have a strong desire for God's love to enter you and you have a strong desire for truth and you're humble, you will not be able to avoid the process. It will automatically occur if you have those three things. That is the truth. But the problem for most of us is, and the reason why we've been giving these talks is we want to help you with humility help you with the openness to truth and so forth and the openness to love, dealing with the emotional reasons why we're saying to God, no, no, don't give me your love, you know, which is really what we're saying a lot of the time to God. So what we're trying to do with these sessions is just open all of those, all of that, the heart in those three areas, if you like. So follow on from that then. Yep. Um, do, do you and Mary and the other um, um, reincarnated souls need to um, achieve Sphere eight again here on Earth. Um, we to rebirth. Do you, is 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 that your goal? When you say that you're missing, um, you're craving for God's love, and you're missing what you had um, um, in spirit form. Uh, that's difficult for me to comprehend that pain that you're feeling because we haven't felt that. Really we can't. feel your emotions when you're talking about it, but we have not felt what you're missing. Reincarnation is much more complex than what I've explained to you. Um, so that's the first thing you need to come to understand. 
in, in a later time, what I will do is I'll explain the full complexities of reincarnation and what actually does occur. But for the moment, if you can imagine, you, you're born on the earth, so when you arrive on the earth, you're basically in a first sphere condition. You progress through all the different spheres, no matter whether you're on the earth or in the spirit world, you progress through it. You achieve a soul union state, so there's somebody else who's also done that, the second half of your soul, who was also born on the earth, eventually does the same thing. And in the soul union state, so this is the soul union state in the 22nd sphere, now you're in that state. From a point of view of love, you can never lose the love that you have. All right? So our unified soul is in a 22nd sphere soul union state. Does that make sense? However, when you reincarnate, the soul has to go through that splitting process again and attaching to the two new bodies, right? And of course, that then begins to absorb all of the emotions of its current environment, which again is in the first sphere state. So, our, our process is a process of mem remembering our previous state emotionally. Does that make sense? To Maybe just the thing about strengthening. You can uh, the same thing about strengthening the connection. That's how I understand it. It's like. Yeah. Um, when At the moment we have a really weak connection with our soul and the truth in that soul and the love in that, that soul and that's because of the emotional injuries. As we release the emotional injuries, then the, it's like the connector gets stronger and that's how AJ soul. just knows so much truth because he just has dealt with so many emotions, it's just flowing more directly. Does that make sense? So, so if you can think about it, like what happens is the emotional baggage from this first fear state basically gets reimposed upon the connection to our own soul because to actually in reincarnate, you couldn't connect to the soul in its full state without killing your mother and yourself. So what you have is a very, what I would classify as an attenuated connection. So if you think of it at the moment, all of you are actually 100% connected to your soul, believe it or not. Right? For me, I'm not 100% connected to my own soul. Because it's too powerful. Right, because my own soul would actually kill me in my current state if I had a, it would kill the body in, this, in its current state. So, so what I have to do is I have to work through all of my emotional blockages so that the soul can connect fully. So that is the same sort of process, and this is the reason why we did it, it's exactly the same sort of process as you have to do. So as I am presenting to you right now, I am not in a soul... Uh, uh, an at one state with God as you're seeing me right now. Because my body would not have these for a start. I'd probably be five inches taller than I currently am. There's quite a number of different things that are going to change once I get into that condition. Does that make sense? So, uh, and, and that is a result of the fact that I've still got all these emotions blocking my own connection with my own self. And, and by the way, when I say my own self, I'm saying this soul is in a soul union state and Mary's blocking her own connection with her own self and it happens to be the one self. Right? And what we want to do is illustrate to you through this entire process, which will take years probably yet, is how the soul comes together as they both progress and how eventually the self is now unified. You will in the future see us acting as one, if you like. A feminine expression and a masculine expression. At the moment, we are still very separate because we're both very separated from our own soul in terms of the emotional condition. So my emotional condition still needs to go through this process that you need to go through. And that's the beauty of, doing, of reincarnating in the manner that we have is that it gives you a complete picture of what's going to happen to you when you're progressing. But the mechanism is very different to what's actually occurring for yourself. So when you and Mary reach that stage here on Earth, that, so you've gone past rebirthing then? We go past, we'll go past the eight spheres yes. and you'll notice the change individually in us when yes. we do that. And then when we get to the 22nd sphere state again, which we will at some point, then you'll notice a change in terms of how we act together. We'll be acting as one. Yeah. Mm. Right. So you'll notice all those changes. Thank you. And all of those things are possible for you to do on earth in exactly the same manner. That's why we want to teach all of that. Does That's that what sense? we want. <laughs> yeah. so, so many of you will definitely get to this stage and some of you may even get to this stage. It just depends on 
What does it depend on? God. Desire. <laughs> in the end, desire for God is, is all that depends on. Desire for God, truth, humility, but in the end it's desire because if you have an immense desire, you will do it in the end. Thank you. Enjoy, and then if we can come. Yeah. <coughs> Sorry, who was... I'm a bit confused. Yeah. Did I, you give some... No? I no, okay. Um, when you taught us about the soul a few, about a month ago, um, you were explaining how when an error gets into the soul, it has to be done emotionally. Yep. Is the same true for truth? I'm trying to find yes. just what, okay. Yes, exactly what is the same. process of going mentally from something that you believe as a concept to yep. really feeling it in the you, you have level. to feel In the end, every single belief you currently have is either in one or two places. It's either just in your head or it's in your heart. When it enters your heart, um, whether it's truth or error, it en and it enters your heart, if it's error, it's really hard to remove because it has to be an emotional experience to remove. And if it's truth, it's a beautiful experience to receive emotionally. So many of us, many of you th think you know the truth from what you've been taught, but are yet to emotionally experience that truth. Does that make sense to you? Who's had that with the law of attraction when emotionally they just went, oh, I get it now. I get it. Like, yeah, well, um, not just from in my head. Yeah, yeah. lots of people. Yeah. yeah. So, so initially it starts off in the head and we get like the awareness in our mind, if you like. But until it enters the soul, it's not real yet. It's, just a fi it's, it's, it's really just a belief system that could easily be discarded. <laughs> when it enters the soul, whether it's error or truth, it is much more difficult to discard. Right? Now, when it's truth and it enters the soul, it will never be discarded. That's the beauty of truth, is that you never need to discard it. You just build on it. It's like you have a foundation. There's a lovely message in the pageant messages written by John, the Apostle John. I, uh, what's it called again? I can't remember what it's called. Um, it's about how to uh, understand truth, how to recognise what's truth, how to build on truth. I, we I I read it out in titled, the Lessons of Natural Love, actually. Yeah. I think it's titled uh, The Process Jesus Went Through to Develop Truth or something like that. And the process as he describes it there is the exact process that I've been through then and still go through now in terms of receiving more truth. Firstly, there's an intellectual awareness. Then what happens is I then work on that intellectual awareness emotionally. What emotions within me need to be released and so forth. And I work through all the different things emotionally. And eventually, if it's a truth, it will settle inside of you emotionally and will never be discarded. Right? And that's the beauty of truth is you never need to discard it. The problem that we have on the planet is we have a lot of error enter our soul in the same manner, right? Where, you know, from our emotional baggage injuries, remember we talked about that a few weeks ago when I talked about the tentacle, where I talked about the soul having pathways like your synapses in your brain and your soul has all these pathways that get opened through error and so the error can enter our soul because of these pathways being opened in the soul that would not normally exist in the soul because of the error. So the process that you outlined yesterday of identifying our emotions that are stopping us from believing that you're Jesus yep. are actually, is actually the same process to As take on emotionally any truth. Exactly. Exactly the same process as then taking on absolutely every single truth of the universe, actually. Yep. Remember I said that thing about when we're at one with God, we'll immediately know truth and error because it's only our emotions that block that process naturally in ourselves. So for any particular issue, it's like my injury around I should be loved. That was a, a, an error belief. And when I released that emotion, the new truth entered me easily. And the new truth was love is a gift. And I, if I expect it, then it's no longer a gift and I'm out of harmony with love. Mm. You know? Jen, thanks up. Up the back there, uh, and, then and then Raya down the front. Thank you, guys. Um, I've I've come to a feeling where I am actually embracing being an emotional being. My question is, um, I've um, first let me say I've valued the fact that, but not appreciated it before, that you guys just seem to process so much and then there's more and more and more and more. I found that daunting. My question is, um, 
do you need to process emotions as individual emotions, the emotion of, say, vulnerability? Or can you start to process um, blocks of, of emotional types? Do you understand my question? Mm -hmm. Do you want to go with that one or do you want me to? Uh, well, for a start, every book... Oh, no, you go. I misunderstood. <laughs> oh, okay. yeah. I, I was going to go somewhere else and I just realised it's not where to go. It's not where, it's not where Jen was asking. Um, Jen, let's look at the soul. The soul, remember all the errors in the soul. So here's, here's your half of the soul. And in your soul, you've got lots and lots of different emotions that come from all sources. You could think of your soul like a tree that's grown. With the tree, it had a root, right? And then it's got all these branches that come off, right? And then the leaves come off of that. And eventually, you've got all these different branches and trees coming off of this root that's into the ground. So you've got the root system underneath the ground. Now, you can think of all of your causal emotions as what's under the ground. Couldn't you? Now, when you look at a tree, you don't see what's under the ground initially, do you? The only way you can see what's under the ground is you start digging around the tree, right? You start digging around the tree and you go, wow, there's a root here, you know, it goes out there. And then you follow that root, don't you? Like you dig along and dig along, dig along, and what's happening is you're following that root out to the end of its tentacle, if you like, to the, to the end of its extension. And really it's the same with you emotionally, right? For a start, when you start looking at your tree, which is the creation of what's inside of your soul, Initially, all you see is the outward appearance, which is not actually a true reflection of what the tree really looks like. You follow me? What it is instead is what part of it you can see, what's grown from this system that supports it. Does that make sense? And so what we're doing, what we're doing on the divine love path is we're getting to the real root of things all the time, the stuff that's underneath. Now, that's not going to be a process that's simple because we've spent all of our time covering that up haven't we? We've spent all of our life trying to cover that up so we don't see it. We only want people and ourselves to see this, right? And it's painful. And, and so, yeah, we start digging around the roots and we go, wow, that root goes way out there. Where, where, where does that root go? Like, we start travelling around like, and we start seeing that it's like a long way away, <laughs> right? And, and the truth is with our emotions, if you expect to process blocks of emotions all at once, you're going to probably be severely disappointed. Because what will happen is that there'll be emotion that you start processing that has all these tentacles that you'll follow bits off at one sitting of an emotional process. process. Yeah, you will actually process a bit of and you might process four or five parts of it even in one sitting, but it's highly unlikely you're going to get to the entire lot in one sitting. 